Across the channel, we've covered disappearances from all over the world, though with a particular focus on North America. Today, let's explore three very unusual disappearances from the UK, Japan and France. All three of these cases have left locals along with the authorities baffled for years. Let's begin by going back to the 29th of April 2005, Japan. At this time, Japan was celebrating Greenery Day, which is a national holiday to show appreciation of nature. This would be the day that five-year-old Yuki Onishi vanished under very unusual circumstances in Kagawa's Goshikidai Forest, where around 60 people that day were celebrating. This group of people were attending a bamboo root digging event, in which from what I can tell, some people in Asia enjoy boiling and eating. In any case, Yuki showed up with her mother and eight-year-old sister that day, and together they began looking for these roots to dig up. Not long into the event, Yuki found her first bamboo root and told her mother that she was going to go and find another, and walked away alone. In this moment, the family went from spending time together and digging up the bamboo to sheer panic when the mother realised that she could no longer see Yuki. Sadly, it was 20 minutes from when Yuki wandered away to the mother scanning the area but realising she couldn't see her anywhere. All 60 of the event goers were quickly mobilised and began to search the area and this continued from around 1.50pm to 3pm, at which time law enforcement was called and arrived on scene. Many volunteers were also called in, and firefighters also got involved in the search, placing hundreds of people now inside the Goshikidai forest, all looking for Yuki. This was a rapid response all things considered, with the unfortunate 20 minute delay at the start. But despite the area being flooded, there was just no indication of Yuki anywhere. This initial search on the day of the disappearance went on for around 6 hours when the authorities arrived before being escalated quickly. It seems that the authorities knew right away how ridiculous the situation was in terms of not being able to find a trace of her anywhere, and it seems that they knew it just didn't make sense. As I'm sure you can imagine, people began speculating as to what happened, and many people believed that a third party must have been involved. And in all fairness, you can see why people might have been drawn to that conclusion. However, something weird happened. Here are some direct quotes from Japanese press outlets that were collected on a Japanese blog. This is translated, and I've had to alter some of it slightly to have it translate well, but I've kept it intact as close to the original writing as I can. The mother said that there were other family members around, and it was a place she could hear voices, so she allowed Yuki to go. There were two witnesses who saw Yuki separate from her mother. One of them was a junior high school girl who had a conversation with Yuki. The other was a man looking down on the south side from the pavilion and saw Yuki walking at 1.40pm. Until 9pm, the police, firefighters and volunteers searched the bamboo forest and the mountain forest but found no clues. Police dogs smelled Yuki's water bottle and were able to follow her scent, but the police dogs stopped in their tracks and stopped moving in an open space in the bamboo forest. Other police dogs stopped at the same spot and stopped following the trail. Get this. It's like a movement that would have to have been lifted straight up by a helicopter or something. The authorities noted at the time that if Yuki had been taken on foot in that moment, the dog should have been able to continue following the scent to her, but this of course did not happen. They also made the point that if their dogs had found another scent there, human or animal, they would have likely followed it. I'm not sure exactly how they would have known that, but they're trained to use these dogs effectively, and so they know more about it than I do. I suppose perhaps the new scent would have been mixed with Yuki's and allowed them to follow, I'm not sure. Also of importance here is that there was no road, it's not like this clearing in the forest was connected to a spot in which a vehicle could have been sat there, and no one heard anything either. It was as if something picked a perfect time to act. 
Whatever happened with Swift left no trace behind and there were no signs of a disturbance and no sounds of something taking place either. The blog continues. The police took the dogs further into the forest, but even after thoroughly searching the forest on the north side, they could still not find a scent. Yuki's last sighting was when she was walking south from where her mother was, but even after the dogs searched that area, there was no trace of her after the clearing. Some believed that she may have fallen into a hole or into a pond, but the police said that their dogs would have found that hole, and if there was a hole that a person could have fallen into, one of the 3,000 people that searched this forest would have found it. Black bears are known to be around this area, but it is unlikely that Yuki had been exposed to a bear, because these bears leave footprints and there would have been drag marks. Considering that Yuki's scent is interrupted in the middle of a forest, it might be more likely to state that a large bird or an animal that crosses a tree might have taken her, but there are no monkeys or chimps in this forest. It's interesting that they bring up the idea of a large bird causing some kind of aerial disappearance. It's not the first time this kind of thing has been brought up. Now, the sheriff said something interesting. Instead of disappearing on foot, the sheriff begins to contemplate a disappearance from above. I could go along with the possibility that he could have been taken by an eagle, but it's difficult to accept the boy's disappearance by either a bear or a cougar, said the sheriff. The articles then go on to briefly discuss eagles and falcons, but the authorities determined that even their largest of eagles there would not have been able to fly away with Yuki in tow. As far as the black bear was concerned, I would actually go slightly further than the writers here and state that never mind just drag marks or animal tracks near this clearing. If a black bear had been involved here, there would have been clear signs of animal predation. That is the type of evidence left behind that you simply cannot miss, as frankly, and without trying to be descriptive, it's very messy. As someone who writes about these disappearances quite often, I've seen a few of these kinds of scenes now, and honestly, I'd prefer that I hadn't seen them. I also think in that scenario, the dogs would have led them right to the spot. Because of these lines of thought that we're exploring, many people believed that it was more likely that she had been taken by a third party. In trying to come up with a way in which the scent might have been completely cut off, it seems that the only reasonable suggestion is that perhaps she could have been placed inside of something, a bag or something similar. Of course, there's also no evidence of that at all and you think that a sound might have been heard if that had gone down, though I'm not actually sure what else could make sense here. Others believed that she might have fallen into the nearby pond, but that was drained and nothing was found in there. The final suggestion was that she simply went too far into the forest and got lost. While certainly possible, and to some, might even have been the most likely scenario, the fact that the dogs couldn't follow her scent past the clearing suggests to me quite strongly that something happened right there. It also seems that the articles were pointing in that direction also. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. That was also the end of the paper trail, so let's now go further back in time. It was late April 1922 when two-year-old Pauline Picard disappeared from her family's farm in the village of Goasaluda, located in the Brittany region of northwest France. Every parent's worst nightmare was realised as she was playing on the grass just by the home, and when her parents came to check on her, she was nowhere to be found. The Picards were said to be absolutely frantic, and they raced to reach people to help search. They had many members of law enforcement on the scene and over 150 people in the local communities who dropped everything to come and help search for her. The farmlands, fields, surrounding woods and countryside were all scoured for any sign of Pauline, but they just couldn't find any trace of her anywhere. Law enforcement tried to come up with a list of hypotheses as to what happened and they concluded that the most likely scenario was that she had wandered off from the farm and succumbed to the elements. In order to explain why there was no trace of her anywhere, 
Law enforcement reasoned that after this, the remains may have been eaten by an animal. The parents didn't seem to be on board with this though, as the problem was that she'd vanished so quickly outside on that morning that they just didn't believe that a two-year-old could get so far away so quickly. A couple of weeks had passed, and the Pickards received word that a two-year-old girl matching Pauline's description had been found wandering alone in Cherbourg, 217 miles away. This was a bizarre turn of events for everyone involved, because after the parents had seen the pictures that were taken of this girl, they were absolutely sure that it was Pauline. After arriving in Cherbourg and spending hours with her, they said that she wasn't behaving normally and didn't seem to recognise them. The family felt that Pauline had just gone through a lot, blocked everything out and needed some time to readjust and to feel safe again. So off they went home, hoping that Pauline's memory would return and that she could explain to them exactly what happened. The neighbours and the other Picard children came to greet Pauline and they all recognised her, and life returned to normal with a sense of relief in the air. Things were different though. The other kids at the farm noted that she was quite fearful and very shy, where before she was not. Pauline's parents continued to attribute this to the experience that she must have gone through. Though curiously, no one had any good ideas as to how she travelled over 200 miles and law enforcement didn't seem to provide any great explanations for this either. I suppose the only way that you can try to reason this away is by offering that perhaps someone had planned to take Pauline on the day of her disappearance, got as far as Shabor, and then changed their mind. I don't really know how likely something like this is, but I don't see any other alternative here to make that make sense. Though it was weeks after she disappeared that she was discovered in Shabor, so it's difficult to say how the parents might have been reasoning this between themselves. I couldn't find any quotes or statements from the parents on this specifically. Things got somewhat strange on the farm over the course of the next few weeks because the parents stated that Pauline was getting better and becoming herself again. But the more time that went on, like the other kids it seems, began to question if this girl really was their daughter. As is often the case in these kinds of disappearances that we cover on the channel, things would take another bizarre turn. In the meantime, the Picards were now very confused about this whole incident. It seems to me that while this girl did in fact look exactly like Pauline, as practically everyone had stated and agreed, I think that the parents desperately wanted her to be Pauline. Their world would come crashing down on the 27th of May, approximately a whole month after her date of disappearance. This next part is reported differently depending on the source, but the outcome is the same. Some outlets report that a farmer found Pauline's body, while others state that it was a cyclist. Now, the problem being here is that she was discovered only 800 yards away from the farm, Law enforcement who organised the search had absolutely no idea how she could have been missed, and again, frustratingly, no offers of an explanation seemed to be forthcoming. To be clear, the body was in a state of decomposition, but Pauline's clothing had been folded neatly right next to her. This included the dress and socks, but the shoes were missing. While it wasn't stated specifically, this has to have been a huge point of contention and confusion for law enforcement, and is probably why they didn't have much of an explanation to begin with. At first, people felt that she might have passed away due to the elements, and then perhaps a wild boar had gotten to the remains. However, that doesn't explain the clothing at all, and also, locals in the area swore blind that they had searched that exact spot numerous times throughout the duration of the search, and she wasn't there. It's important to detail something here. When the remains were discovered, authorities noted that a head was found nearby, but was too big for the body, and thus, it was realised that there were two victims here. French officials got involved now, and formally collated all of the details that had transpired so far, including the fact that the villagers had said that they searched that exact spot over and over again during the search effort. People began to suspect that someone wanted the body to be found. 
While I'm not sure who performed the autopsy, what's particularly saddening is that Dr. Garreau would later study the remains as part of the autopsy or had permission afterwards, and he believed that he'd found signs of something bad happening in terms of third party involvement. However, it's important to note that the autopsy itself didn't actually provide any conclusive evidence, and there were two parties, again, one that believed that the cause of passing was down to something terrible, and others who believed it was accidental and caused by exposure. That is quite bizarre honestly, and frankly confusing. I'm not sure how Dr. Garreau believed he'd found evidence on the body of something particularly sinister, but then it provided no conclusive evidence either way. That's somewhat confusing, and also, from what I'm able to ascertain, it seems that many people believed it was down to exposure, even after finding what looks to have been a second victim in the same spot as Pauline was found. I'm not actually sure what was going on there. In fact, the judge, formerly in charge of the investigation, determined that Pauline's passing was accidental. I have no idea if there were those who just wanted to sweep this under the rug or what, but those are some wildly varying, and frankly, contradictory causes. Things got weird again, with some articles seeming to suggest that perhaps the body was not Pauline's and the girl in the Picard's care was actually Pauline, but that seems unlikely. And now, questions about who this girl actually was arose. No one ever came forth to claim that she was their daughter, but she would be placed in care and then passed away two years afterwards due to an outbreak of measles. I'm not sure how you find the evidence of the remains left behind in the field. Come to the conclusion that there were two victims. Have Dr. Garreau, who believes he'd found evidence of something perhaps quite terrible, and then come to the conclusion that she must have succumbed to the elements. That just seems very odd to me. What do you think? This final case I want to cover is of a disappearance I relayed over four years ago now but I've revoiced it to bring it up to date. It's absolutely bizarre and certainly worth sharing again. In the early part of the 18th century, Owen Parfit, along with his family, lived in a small town in the west of England known as Shepton Mallet. Shepton Mallet is a civil parish in the Mendip district of Somerset with a population today of approximately 10,000 people, though that will have been far fewer over 250 years ago. It's unclear how many siblings Owen actually had, but it's understood that he did have one older sister named Mary, who was 15 years older. During his younger years, Owen was apprenticed by his father and put to work as a tailor. It was stated that he learned this trade well, but hated sewing day in and day out. Owen grew tired of this and eventually enrolled as a soldier. For many years after enlisting, Owen was somewhat forgotten. His parents had passed away at this point and all that was left was Mary. Sometimes she would receive reports stating where in the world he was on active duty, but by and large she often had no idea where her younger brother was. Eventually, Owen did return to Mary, though many years had passed and he wasn't in such great shape anymore and suffered harshly from rheumatism. He did say that he loved his time serving, but it was clear that this time spent had taken its toll. While Owen was still able-bodied in the sense that he could still walk, his movements were very slow and he couldn't do it for long. His plan was to get back into tailoring to help support himself and Mary who were now back living together. The house was just off the main street where the garden connected to it. This was quite a rural home at the time and it was completely surrounded by forestry and fields for miles in every direction. There was a nice small community in the area and Owen would often sit in the garden and talk with some friends who he'd met in the area. However, over time, Owen's rheumatism only got worse and worse and in the end, he couldn't walk or even move much without help. In the end, and for years, he could barely even move his hands, never mind his legs, which makes his disappearance just that much stranger. As said, Owen was 65 years old and Mary was now 80, so she was quite a bit older. But she did care for Owen, however, she had gotten much weaker and struggled to move him by herself. So, on the afternoon of a June day, 
1768, Mary asked one of her neighbours, by the name of Susanna Snook, who lived no more than 50 yards away, to come and help her. And together, they managed to take Owen to his usual chair in the garden. Owen always wore comfortable night clothing at this point, and always had his coat with him in the garden. After Susanna made Owen comfortable, she went back inside to Mary, and then left for her home through the back door. Now, this is where things get bizarre. Mary had planned to sit with Owen outside in the garden, but first wanted to tidy the cottage. This took her approximately 30 minutes, and when she went outside to join Owen, he wasn't there. She looked around briefly, but he was nowhere to be seen. She then went to retrieve Susanna, who was left dumbfounded and had no idea where he could have gone. This was a man who could barely move, and yet somehow, the garden seat was empty, and Owen was nowhere to be seen. To make matters even stranger, was the fact that the nearby fields surrounding the cottage were full of people as it was the haymaking season, and yet no one had seen anything. Mary was said to be distraught, and Susanna had another look round and asked Mary if she'd heard anything, but she hadn't. Susanna also detailed that the chair was left in the same position that she'd left it. The pair raised the alarm, and the neighbours, alongside those working in the fields, got together and made a thorough sweep of the area. This included around the cottage, the fields, the nearby forestry, and the town, but there was no sign of him. This was regarded as highly unusual given his condition, and the fact that he really shouldn't have been able to get very far. In addition to this, nearby ponds, wells, and ditches were scoured, along with outhouses, but these searches didn't find a single trace as to where Owen had gone. Here's a quote from the author, Mrs. Lang, who wrote about this disappearance in her book, titled The Strange Storybook. Why would anyone wished to hide a harmless, old disabled man in any of these places. It didn't make sense. Nobody stopped to ask how this could have been done in broad daylight. But in spite of the thorough nature of the hunt, which did not cease, even during a sharp thunderstorm, and went on all that night and the next day, then, nor later, was any trace ever found of Owen Parfit. This is an old publication, that dated back to 1912, and was the oldest piece of documentation that I could find in regards to Owen. Many people who take an interest in these kinds of disappearances cite bad weather conditions hitting the area when a case like this takes place, so perhaps that might be of note to some. In any case, a Dr. Butler, who would be the future Bishop of Litchfield, took a particular interest in this disappearance, though it isn't clear why. Dr. Butler led the investigation as to what may have happened, but unlike today's times, things were not documented so thoroughly. Dr. Butler first questioned as to whether Owen had been taken by someone, but conceded that it was very unusual that nothing was heard. He also detailed that if that was the case, then the many people in the fields should have seen or heard something. He also inquired as to whether Owen was actually as disabled as everyone thought he was, or whether he simply disappeared intentionally. However, this was disputed pretty much immediately, with locals telling him that he hadn't been seen on his feet in years. Bizarrely, there was a rumour that a person who fit Owen's description had been wandering near a town roughly 12 miles away in a field, but that was deemed as impossible to be Owen. Some bones were eventually found near the area in 1814, but they were discovered as belonging to a female who had passed years prior. Interestingly, the locals attributed Owen's disappearance with something evil, stating that they believed that he'd been taken by this force. To this day, no one knows what happened to Owen, or where he went. Dr. Butler said that he gave up, and stated that it was an impossible riddle. To quote many articles on this disappearance, Owen seems to have disappeared into thin air. With that, I'd just like to take the time to thank you for watching, and a big thank you to the patrons who've been running around and disappearing on the screen. If you found the video interesting, then please do leave a like, hit the bell, and subscribe if you haven't already. If not, then feel free to leave a dislike, I'm just looking for your honest opinion either way. I hope that you've had a great day, or evening, depending on where you are. 
and I'll see you in the next one. Be safe guys, peace.